On this Friday night, the year's strongest storm lashes the Philippines. While closer to home, Florence hammers the U.S. with deadly consequences. Tonight, we are tracking both monster systems as millions of people do what they can to stay safe. But it isn't easy, and there's more danger coming. Also tonight, cyber criminals turn their attention to a town's computer network, how hackers held Midland, Ontario hostage, and why officials paid them off. A disturbing trend. This is The National. It is an epic disaster that's playing out in slow motion. What remains of Hurricane Florence is still threatening millions of people on the U.S. East Coast this evening. And this is more than 24 hours after it first started battering North Carolina. At least four people have been killed. A fifth person died after suffering a heart attack. Help couldn't reach her. And damage and flooding is widespread. This is what it looks like tonight in North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Florence has been downgraded to a tropical storm, but it's still big and still dangerous because it just won't move on. Florence was a Category 1 hurricane when its strongest winds hit North Carolina before dawn. Oh, my gosh. Whoa. The eye made landfall around 7 a.m. local time. The storm's powerful winds knocked out power to hundreds of thousands of homes. Huge trees collapsed. One of them fell on and killed a mother and her eight-month-old baby right in their own home. Water's still high. Then there was the water. Florence's storm surge and heavy rains inundated the city of New Bern. I've never been so terrified in my entire life. Emergency responders rushed in and brought hundreds of people to safety. And tonight, across the region, the message is clear. This isn't over, not by a long shot. Rivers are rising to dangerous levels. And the relentless rains will continue through the weekend. Now, the CBC's Paul Hunter is in Wilmington, North Carolina, again tonight in one of those potential flood zones. And, Paul, it looks messy out there. You know, you talk about relentless rains. Here we go again. We, we, we tried to get out in this today and sort of check out the, uh, the, the part of North Carolina that we're in. We're, so, we're sort of partway between Wilmington and the Atlantic uh, right now. We spent all of our day in that region just trying to see what we could see. And I'm telling you, it's a mess. Look down almost any street in Wilmington, North Carolina this morning, and the ferocity of Florence is evident everywhere. Maybe not as powerful as everyone expected, but packing a serious punch nonetheless. Trees not just toppled, but splintered, uprooted, and littering the roadways, testing what power lines remain. Volunteers braved the still forceful wind and rain to help make way for others, not least those in need. But those trees seemed at every corner. Then again, few worried about the wind that brought down so much. The real concern, that water rising overnight and threatening all in its path. Before the storm hit, that was a backyard just outside Wilmington. Not today. Just to give you a sense of how high the surge is getting already, we were here yesterday, and this is a parking lot that stretches pretty much to that pole out there. This is what's happened overnight. The wind is brutal. The water is rising. It's about at my knees already, and you can feel it getting higher even as we stand here speaking. And the thing is, no one can say how bad this will get. And as the water rises, so do the worries. In the water, in a sense, a state trooper. Your main message to people who are in shelters, who've abandoned their homes to stay safe for the moment, what is your main message? Stay put. Um, let the storm move past. The, the basic thing is to make sure everybody stays home. That's what we're trying to uh, tell everybody. Stay home and stay safe and, and wait till this. we all get through it. Easier said than done. Is this your first time here since, like, today? Yes, it is. Out to survey some of his family properties at Water's Edge today, Kentley Hall. His place, hidden by the fallen tree, sits directly in the path of the ever-rising seawater. By far, this is the worst we've ever seen. We went through um, a lot of hurricanes, Bertha and Fran and 
some of the other ones, but by far, this is the worst we've seen. Grateful his family is all right. Buildings can be repaired or replaced, he told us. Now it's a wait and see. As North Carolina waits, it's bad enough already. How bad? <laughs> You know, you talk about the rising waters with this storm, and that remains a prime worry, but let's consider the wind again. Check this out. You might have seen this in the piece. This is one of these, you know, flat top gas station canopies. We were driving along here earlier today, and we saw it. We thought, did that happen overnight? We came out to take some pictures of it, and some of the neighbors who are still here came out, and I said, that happened last night? They said, absolutely. Five o'clock this morning, they heard a, you know, boom. They looked out, and this thing just crashed over. The water is rising, that's the problem, but the wind was wicked as well. This storm gets you both ways, Andrew. No, oh, it's it's incredible to see. And, and Paul, you talk about the power of the wind. I mean, can you tell us just a little bit more about what it's like to, to be in the thick of that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we were driving around today amid all those trees and and trying to, you know, just see what we could see. And we're sort of, sort of constantly looking at the, the, a radar app on our iPhones, right? And you, you, like you see Wilmington right in the bullseye of this giant sort of yellow and orange and then red blob of storm. And you're, you're right in the red and you're thinking, well, no wonder it's so intense, right? It's crazy. And then it kind of stops. I mean, even as it just did here and now, it seems. And like the wind went away, the rain stopped. You think, well, is that it? That wasn't so bad. And then it would kick in again. And it's like, oh, it starts all over again. And that's the problem with this storm. It's relentless. It keeps coming and coming and coming at you. Like this, this one doesn't want to stop. And that, Andrew, is the problem. Paul, always good to hear from you out there. And I've said it before, I'll say it again. Stay safe. Paul Hunter in the storm zone tonight in Wilmington, North Carolina. Now, on the other side of the planet, another storm, much more powerful than Florence, if you can believe that. Typhoon Mangut slammed into the northern Philippines, bringing fierce winds of over 265 kilometers an hour. Officials say tens of thousands of people have been evacuated from the coast because storm surges are expected to be anywhere from three to six meters high. Think about how much water that is. The ground floor of your home would be completely submerged. And check out this video one person sent us showing damage from the typhoon. You can see that tin roof just torn right off one building. And there are Canadians there too, about 3,400 of them registered in the impact zone. So let's bring in our meteorologist, Johanna Wagstaff, who's been tracking both of these storms all day. And Joe, what stage of the game are we at now with Mangut? Is the danger ramping up or ramping down? Well, Andrew, hopefully we'll start to see some improvement across the northern Philippines over the next 24 hours. I want to show you the latest satellite imagery, and you can see that the eye, or what's left of the eye, is actually back over the open waters to the west of the Philippines now. Uh, but notice how well-defined that eye was before it made landfall. It took about six hours to traverse across that northernmost island. It's a mountainous uh, part of the Philippines, so that really helped to tear the storm apart so winds have weakened substantially now that it's back over the open water it's going to start feeding off those very warm temperatures above seasonal temperatures for this time of the year so the west coast of the philippines uh, will continue to get lashed and storm surge even a concern on the west side uh, over the next uh, day or so but again the storm is beginning to move away from the philippines and hopefully we'll get some idea especially for those small communities who took a direct hit of uh, of what's left there Right. Okay. And Joe, let's talk Florence because what Paul made clear is that in some places the water has just kept rising. My question is, how much worse can it get? So in this case, unfortunately, the worst may still be to come. We have only seen a third of the total rainfall amounts we may end up with across the uh, coast of the Carolinas. Even though this storm continues to weaken, it also continues to slow down and tap into that Atlantic moisture. It's a much smaller and much weaker storm than the typhoon we're tracking, but this storm is so different in how much moisture it's bringing in. So far, the top, so far, the top end rain rainfall amounts are about 400 to 500 millimeters. We could be talking double, if not triple, those numbers by the time.
time we get to Sunday and by the time this storm finally picks up speed and moves towards New England. Andrew, this storm is in the running for the biggest rainfall maker ever for an East Coast landfalling hurricane. Yeah, it's hard to imagine just how much water that is. Meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff, thanks so much. You're welcome. Here's what else we're working on tonight. We're in Boston, where natural gas explosions left dozens of houses in ruins. So how could that happen? We're also digging into some big political stories. Donald Trump's former campaign chair pleads guilty and agrees to cooperate. What could it mean for the Russia investigation? But first, here at home, how Maxime Bernier and his new political party plan to win your vote. It's called the People's Party of Canada, but the former Conservative MP took the stage alone to launch it. You may remember Bernier quit the Conservatives last month, calling the party intellectually and morally corrupt. And as Catherine Cullen reports, his new party could be striding into some controversial territory. Here it is, the People's Party of Canada, PPC. And it seems as the person behind the People's Party, Maxim Bernier wants to have a serious talk about the people coming into this country. Look on Bernier's Facebook forums and you'll find lots of comments about immigration and national identity, like this one. Hey, the great thing about Maxim's party is we are at least having a discussion about this, which is totally verboten in literally every other major party. 49% of Canadians are saying that there's too much immigration in Canada. 49% of Canadians are saying that. So I think we must, I want to have this debate and I'm, I'm very open for immigration. You guys are under arrest for having crossed the border illegally, do you understand? No. Bernier believes the asylum seeker situation is a crisis, but he also really doesn't like this. We truly believe that diversity is a source of strength. Not all diversity is good, counters Bernier. People have to embrace Canadian values like tolerance and equality, he says. And what evidence does he have that that is a problem? I'm not saying that people who are coming today, they're not sharing Canadian values. I want to be sure that people will come in the future, they will always share Canadian values. But how? How are we going to do that? That's a good question, and we'll have that discussion with Canadians. No specific plan for values, but Bernier does want to drop the number of immigrants overall and increase the ratio of economic immigrants compared to refugees and family reunifications, an idea that could also appeal to white nationalists. When he says he's not happy with immigration, he's going to be, he could be inviting some of the wrong type of people. I think he anticipates that already, but it's going to be a challenge for him. Bernier says he wants nothing to do with xenophobes or racists. They don't have a place in our party. They don't have a place. I don't share these values. It may be the People's Party, but Bernier insists there are some people whose views aren't welcome. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Let's turn to some drama south of the border and what could be troubling news for Donald Trump. His former campaign chair, Paul Manafort, has agreed to cooperate with the Mueller investigation. It's part of his plea deal on criminal charges, and it means investigators are further into the president's inner circle of advisors. The big question now, what will Manafort reveal? Keith Bogue has more. Paul Manafort pleaded guilty to conspiracy and witness tampering, and that's in addition to his conviction at trial last month for other financial crimes. He's been in jail since June, except for court appearances, so his lawyer did the talking today. Tough day for Mr. Manafort, but he's accepted responsibility. The big news is that Manafort will cooperate with the special counsel Robert Mueller's investigation into whatever ties Donald Trump's presidential campaign might have had with Russia. Yeah, do I know the... In happier times, Manafort was a globe-trotting political operative who made millions from foreign governments and who had close ties to the Kremlin. In 2016, he wound up managing Donald Trump's presidential campaign for a few weeks. That connection is ultimately what led Mueller to investigate Manafort's past and to charge him with bank fraud, money laundering, tax fraud and other crimes. This is for conduct that dates back many years, and everybody should remember that. The importance of that point was made clearer by White House Press Secretary Sarah Huckabee Sanders. This had absolutely nothing to do with the president or his victorious 2016 presidential campaign. It is totally unrelated, she said in a statement. Trump has sought to both downplay Manafort's involvement in the campaign and to portray him as a victim of an unfair and aggressive investigation. 
It doesn't involve me, but I still feel, uh, you know, it's a very sad thing that happened. We have a sense of how Trump will feel about the news that Manafort has, as they say, flipped and will cooperate with Mueller. It's called flipping, and it almost ought to be illegal. You get 10 years in jail, but if you say bad things about somebody, in other words, make up stories if you don't know, make up stories, they just make up lies. For nearly a year, Manafort has resisted cooperating. That's over. Now let's bring in Keith to talk some more about this. Keith, what, what kinds of things will the special counsel want to talk to Paul Manafort about? Well, the plea agreement says Manafort has to answer anything Mueller wants to ask him about. Now, we have no idea what the range of those questions might be, but we do know some things Manafort could talk about. For instance, Manafort was in the room for the Trump campaign's meeting with Russians to get dirt on Hillary Clinton during the election campaign. And we've been told that meeting didn't amount to anything. Manafort can say whether that's the truth. This sounds like it's a bad day for the president, but, but, but is it? Well, it's never a good day for Donald Trump when another close campaign aide agrees to cooperate with Robert Mueller. We assume that Manafort got a plea deal because he has a story to tell. What that story is, we don't know yet. All right, Keith, thank you. There is anger, exhaustion, and a need to get to the bottom of a deadly mystery just north of Boston tonight. The extent of the damage was clear today after a series of natural gas explosions leveled dozens of homes yesterday, killing one person and forcing thousands to evacuate. The governor declared a state of emergency and local leaders expressed outrage over the response from Columbia Gas. The least informed and the last to act has been Columbia Gas. They're hiding from the problem. Officials have slapped the company with $100,000 in fines. Its president, contrite, but offered few answers. We are sorry. We're sorry and deeply concerned about the inconvenience. The state has now removed the company as the lead in the recovery efforts and put another gas company, Columbia's competitor, in charge. Residents, not surprisingly, are frustrated. Stephen D'Souza spoke to people still trying to process yesterday's chaotic scenes. It was totally like a like an Armageddon. It was an Armageddon last night. Outside one of the area shelters, Henry Schiebel knows he narrowly avoided disaster last night. My gas was making a shishing sound. It was like shh. He rushed his family out and saw a neighborhood in chaos. Dozens of fires spread across three towns. A house a block away just blew up. It just caught on fire and went right down like a piece of paper. This is what's left of that house. 18-year-old Lynn O'Rendon was visiting a friend when the chimney collapsed onto the car he was sitting in, killing him. The surrounding neighborhood is practically deserted. Power has been shut down. Residents only allowed to return under police escort to grab vital supplies before returning to shelters and hotels. If something went dramatically wrong somewhere, and we hope they'll get to the bottom of this, and um, because this community deserves better than that. His frustration and anger shared by the thousands forced from their homes. How do I have any confidence that you're going to fix this now? So we Can I really want to call you back on that. They demanded answers from the gas company, and like city officials, got nothing. You guys are kind of like deflecting every question. It's not so much a deflection; it's it's trying to answer these question. responsibly. In, we will. Meanwhile, along practically empty main streets, utility workers went door to door, business to business, painstakingly checking every potential problem spot for leaks and flare-ups. How long that process will take is still up in the air. Will you feel safe when you go back home? Um, you know what? Okay. If they tell me I'm safe to go back home, I'm going to have to take their word yep. because it's the only home I got. <laughs> but just when that will be, he doesn't know. So, like many here, he waits. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, North Andover, Massachusetts. Investigators suspect the cause is overpressurization of gas lines. So, what does that mean? And just how could it trigger that deadly series of explosions? Natural gas travels through the state on high-pressure pipelines. Substations reroute the gas to communities, but before it gets to homes, the pressure is dropped from 60 pounds per square inch to just a quarter of a pound. 
But in this case, something happened that caused that pressure to remain high. Perhaps it was equipment failure, human error, or something intentional. So why didn't all the houses explode? Natural gas is volatile, too little, and it's not flammable enough, too much, and the mixture is considered too rich to burn. But at just the right concentration, plus an ignition source, a pilot light on a gas heater, furnace, or fireplace, even static electricity, well, that can cause a massive explosion. Scary stuff. Okay, up next on The National, we'll take you to Midland, Ontario, a city held hostage by hackers and forced to pay a ransom. Why municipalities are prime targets for cyber attacks. And a little later, as filmmakers push to tell diverse stories with diverse casts, what about the diversity of those people reviewing the films? And with legal pot just weeks away, we'll go inside the classroom as the first group of students learn to grow marijuana. Could you have imagined all those years ago working as a Mountie that you would be growing weed one day? <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> This next story sounds like it's straight out of a movie. Hackers take control of a city's computer system, bringing regular business to a screeching halt, and then they demand a ransom. But for the people of Midland, Ontario, it happened, and not for the first time in this country. Salima Shivji has the story. It's been a rough two weeks for the town of Midland. Uh, I'm sorry, our system is currently down at the moment. Ever since hackers took over these computers and demanded a ransom. Nobody likes to be held hostage, and it's just sort of, how dare you do this to our town, and uh, where did you come from, and why are you doing this sort of thing? But then you go into recovery mode, and that's what you do, first of all, to assess what the damage is and what you need to recover. The damage, most everything has to be processed by hand. So that'll get you to Penetang, then you can... To renew your bus pass or get a marriage license, you're sent to a nearby town, and you can't pay your taxes. The town can't process them. Kind of leaves us hanging with our bills and keeping track of our finances and stuff like that. And this arrangement looks great too. An inconvenience too for this event planner. The lull in his business with the city is accompanied by a sinking feeling. To be honest with you, fear. Like how a little town like us can be hacked. You know, what, what, what's next? The irony is at the time of the attack, the town was almost done upgrading its system to make it more secure. And it had taken out insurance against ransomware attacks after what happened to another small Ontario town. Nearby Wasaga Beach negotiated their hackers down this spring, but eventually had to pay $34,000 in untraceable Bitcoin. It's a growing problem with many municipalities' prime targets, especially as some move towards smart technology and the security vulnerabilities that come with that. They often don't have any full-time security staff, and so they're making decisions often that may be slightly out of date because it's very difficult to keep up with the latest in security. As for Midland, its system is almost back up and running. The town paid the ransom. It won't say how much, but it's covered by insurance. The mayor has a warning for others. You can't stop them all, no matter how well-intentioned you are. Best to be ready for when the hackers strike. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Midland, Ontario. Ahead tonight on The National, you'll meet a Polaris Prize-nominated singer. Jeremy Dutcher is Indigenous. His latest music explores his ancestors' difficult relationship with their language, inspired by recordings that are more than a century old that were lost for a generation. Getting to hear my ancestors laugh, tell stories, sing songs, you know, dance. You can hear them dancing. This is incredible to me. Tonight on The National, we're going in-depth on art through the lens of identity. You'll hear an Indigenous opera singer who found powerful inspiration in 100-year-old recordings of music his people used to make. But first, as the film industry slowly embraces diversity, most film critics are still white men who don't reflect the diverse movie audience. We raise that question on the red carpet in Toronto. What it is now is it's not reflective. It's not reflecting of the demographic of the world. But we're telling world stories. It doesn't make sense. A change is coming to the world of movie reviews. With the Toronto International Film Festival in full swing, Eli Glasner shows us what's being done. For critics covering TIFF, this is your glamorous life. 
11 days of shuffling between lineups and press conferences. But this year, the critics covering the movies look a little different. Meet Yolando Machado and Valerie Complex, two of the 174 new journalists attending TIFF this year, an effort by the organization to bring fresh critical perspectives. Complex is a black queer woman from the Bronx. Machado is a Latino feminist from Los Angeles. I use La La Land as my example a lot, not saying that I don't like it, but when people were just on and on about it, I went to see it, walked out. LA is a city with over five million Latinos. Why is there not even one in any shot? <laughs> to help get more points of view like Machado's, Tiff worked with Rotten Tomatoes, Netflix, and film studios, paying for accommodations and travel to increase the media list by 20%. Besides reporting, I also review movies on CBC. And part of the problem is most film critics look a lot like me. Take a look at the organization I belong to, the Toronto Film Critics Association. It currently has 40 members, but less than one-third are female and just five are people of color. And it's not just a Toronto issue. Professor Stacy Smith studied over 59,000 reviews on Rotten Tomatoes. At a panel on media diversity, she didn't hold back. I promise, depressing, I'm delivering. Only 21% of the reviews on Rotten Tomatoes were written or authored by female reviewers. Of top critics, the underrepresented number dips down to 12%. Professor Smith's research also shows how a critic's identity affects how a film is reviewed, which is what happened at TIFF for the movie If Beale Street Could Talk. I love you. From the director of the Oscar-winning Moonlight, the movie follows a woman trying to save her fiancé, wrongly accused of a crime. Critics of color described it as a movie that contains multitudes and a heart-swelling Harlem romance. But many were offended by variety critic Peter de Bruges, who zeroed in on the too cute costumes and described Canadian Stefan James as a baby daddy. Now, yes, I am a white dude, and I loved Moonlight, but... I was underwhelmed by Beale Street, so I decided to hash it out with Valerie Complex. I felt like his character was so... It was almost like he was on a pedestal. He was so just beautiful artist, suffering. Sometimes, depending on who you are, you may not have male role models or it may not have been treated in the way you should be treated by a certain someone. And so this is why the character may have been put on a pedestal because we don't do that enough for black men. That kind of insight is why Tiff brought Complex to Toronto. But even more than sharing her view, what made Tiff stand out was the access. Invitations to things um, and people actually answering their emails when I email them. Um, and that means work for you. Saying yes means work. At the end of the fest, Yolando Machado has a brain-melting 30 films for review under her belt. A lot of material to pitch to clients, though what she really wants is a full-time job with a major paper. As far as the outlets that really need changes, mm -hmm. nothing. The outlets you work for, would they have been able to afford to send you? No, they don't, they don't fund freelancers. So without this program, you wouldn't I be. would not be here. <laughs> As TIFF wraps up, the Me Too-inspired legal fund, Time's Up, is also launching its own initiative, a database of underrepresented voices called Critical. The goal? To make it easier for studios to find critics left out of the spotlight. Eli Glasner, CBC News, Toronto. Now get ready to hear some music recorded more than a century ago, but rarely heard since then. It's given an Indigenous opera singer a greater sense of purpose. Jeremy Dutcher is a classically trained operatic tenor from the Tobik First Nation in New Brunswick. His latest album was inspired by recordings that he discovered in the Canadian Museum of History, and they've changed his life. When I came into a better understanding of my language, Wolustigwe, I started to understand my place in the world a little bit better and started to relate to the world around me differently. And so that's why it was important for me to, to do this album in my language, because there's less than 100 fluent speakers left.
I think it's important to, for people to understand a true history and what has actually happened and what continues to happen in this country um, around the systematic devaluing of indigenous languages and culture. As soon as I came to understand a little more about my mother's journey with the language, she went into the day schools um, at a very young age when she was six years old, and you weren't allowed to speak your language there. In fact, you were, you were physically punished, you were beaten if you did. You know, coming to understand that it wasn't safe for her to speak her language when she was young. And her mother, um, my grandmother, said, you know, it's better if you don't know the language, and so we're just not going to speak it to you. Intergenerational effects of that shame around language and culture um, are clear. And so that's why I turned to the archive. So when I first got to hear these voices, um, that word for me was a profoundly transformational moment in my life. And it connected me all the way up and down to those who have gone before and those who have yet to come. At first, I would, I would listen over and over again. I would start to sketch where the melody was going. And then finally, after that, I could, I could put some notes to it. I sort of took those notes with me and, and went home and started to sit at my piano. And to create arrangements and worlds around each of these melodies and let those melodies guide my process. I was very, very fortunate, you know, to have a music education and to be able to, you know, to transcribe what I was hearing. It was a process of deep listening, of really trying to sit there with these headphones and hear what these voices had to tell me. Getting to witness the life in these recordings, getting to hear my ancestors laugh, tell stories, sing songs, you know, dance, you can hear them dancing. This is incredible to me. You know, this was collected in the early 1900s and it's been living in the museum ever since. You know, as a young person, I didn't know about this collection and these songs and so for me, I felt such a responsibility to go and share that with other young people. So when you look at the album cover, you can see wax cylinders on the floor, which were uh, what these were collected on, using the phonograph machine in the middle there. Uh, and I'm seated in the chair with this uh, traditional jacket on. I wanted to represent that time that these songs were collected. And so that was sort of where, where this whole album kind of came from, was that impetus to say, I've witnessed this beautiful thing, these old voices, and it's not doing any good sitting on a shelf collecting the dust. This project allowed me to do was like sit down with my mother and my elders in my community and, and ask them about their lives and say, what was your experience of music growing up? What did, what did your community sound like? you know, growing up. For me, starting, you know, this record, it's called, uh, with a death chant, Mejanud, was a very clear statement to me that even though a lot of narratives get applied to our languages, especially Wolistuwe, you know, because there's so few speakers left, a lot of people say, oh, it's a dying language, you know? Um, I don't believe that to be true. Nothing ever died. You know, our dances and our songs and our language, they just had to go away for a bit for safekeeping. And our elders tell us that it's time. It's time to take it all out and it all needs to come out. And it won't be until then that we're going to be able to come to understand each other. Tahoe.
Jeremy Dutcher's album has been shortlisted for the 2018 Polaris Music Prize. It's awarded on the basis of artistic merit to a full-length Canadian album. The winner will be announced Monday at a ceremony in Toronto. And up next on The National, we will take you back to school for a brand new class that's the first of its kind. Well, how did people react when you told them you wanted to grow <laughs> wheat? There were many, many reactions across the board. First, though, a preview of an interview you'll see here Sunday night on The National. Quincy Jones, the man behind so much music. I sat down with a legendary producer. We talked about the moment he brought together the biggest stars of a generation. Let's talk about We Are The World, one of the best-selling records of all time. There have been lots of other groups that have done similar songs, including here in Canada. First of all, that line, park your ego at the door, that you put up in a sign, who came up with that? I did, but it wasn't necessary. They came in for the right reasons. They really did. They came there to give back. And that's, you know, it wasn't necessary. We all a part of God's great big family. And the truth, you know love is all we need. Was there a lot of politics trying to figure out who would do which vocals and yeah, how to balance and, it? Yeah, and also placement, all, yeah. all kind of stuff, yeah. Who's and I take had care to, of that? Well, I had to take care of telling 46 people only 21 could sing solos. Yeah. That was not popular at all. I mean, they were freaking out, man. Who did you have to say no to? Well, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> but you can imagine that. <laughs> Tonight on The National, we are learning about another alleged plot by Russian spies in Europe. Switzerland says two alleged spies were caught a few months ago trying to hack a Swiss lab that tests chemical weapons. And it's the same lab where samples of Novichok were sent for analysis. That's the nerve agent used to attack former spy Sergei Skripal on British soil. Russia calls the accusation absurd. I'm here to show support to the victim's family and the victim. And I'm here to support our community. This was outside of Vancouver Courthouse today as the man accused of killing 13-year-old Marissa Shen made his first court appearance. Ibrahim Ali has been charged with first-degree murder. He was arrested just last week, more than a year after Shen's body was found in a park in Burnaby, the victim of what police called a random attack. And new details tonight about potential trouble at the U.S. border when marijuana is legalized here. Not only are Canadians who use marijuana at risk of being turned back, a senior U.S. customs official told news site Politico they may also reject people who work or even invest in the weed business. Remember, it's still illegal under U.S. federal law, even if some states allow it. So officials say they have the right to refuse entry. And legalization here in Canada is coming fast, less than a month away now, which means it's go time for companies scrambling to find employees who are qualified to grow their product. And you might be surprised to learn there's a school in Ontario that's looking to help. This month, Niagara College launched its brand new commercial cannabis production program. And Aaron Saltzman was there for day one of pot school. <laughs> It looks like a prison, protected by chain-link fence and barbed wire, closed-circuit cameras, and a serious-looking security system. But this is actually a classroom. It's the teaching lab for Niagara College's new cannabis production program. They call it the Cannabunker. This is the first day of classes, and the media is here, but a last-minute regulatory snag means there aren't any cannabis plants yet. If someone can cut two of the plants off so we just have the soil, that would be very good. So for today's photo op, Professor Bill McDonald has them using the remnants of house plants. Just because if it goes on TV and we're using poinsettias, it's like, seriously, I thought you were teaching cannabis. They are. 
This is the first post-secondary commercial cannabis production program in Canada, according to the college. Clearly a bit of a challenge to set up when the subject matter doesn't become legal until six weeks after school starts. But the dean says the college didn't want to wait. The demand is there for our graduates. Too. Vivian Kennard says legalization has created a labor crunch. Well, what better place for someone to get hands-on experience with weed than a college campus? Well, they're not being taught theoretically. They're not being taught by simulation. They are actually being taught with real hands-on in the workplace experiences while they're still a student. I never thought five years ago that we would be here in this classroom starting a course on commercial cannabis production. There is a classroom component where students will learn about things like regulatory and trade requirements, but this is mainly a course that will teach these students how to become very good at growing pot. So how did people react when you told them you wanted to grow <laughs> weed? There are many, many reactions across the board. Um, you know, some people still say I'm studying horticulture to their friends, which is fine. I think there is still a lot of growth in terms of how people view this kind of science. But at the end of the day, it is a science. You know, we are growing plants and in a lot of ways, uh, medicinal cannabis, cannabis has helped many people. Elizabeth Foley has an honors degree in biology from Western University. She was one of hundreds of applicants. Only 24 students got in. Student John Skilnick is an ex-cop. Could you have imagined all those years ago working as a Mountie that you would be growing weed one day? <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> I did have to reconcile with myself the whole idea of legalization, having been in the RCMP. As I thought about it, uh, I sort of did reconcile that if this is an opportunity to do things right, and I think in order to do them right, the industry um, has to bring cannabis into the mainstream, and we have to um, change the perception of cannabis use. Here is where the jobs are. This nearly 50,000 square meter greenhouse complex is owned by Can Trust, a medical marijuana producer that is now ramping up production in advance of legalized recreational use. Are you hiring right now? Oh, unstopping. Yep, the, the hiring process happens uh, all the time. Uh, so every week it's a new headcount. This is an industrial operation, but also a meticulous, even clinical process with a small army of white-suited workers carefully cultivating plants and creating customized strains. We operate a very technical grow, so it can be likened to a Ferrari. Um, and everybody thinks they can drive a Ferrari, but of course you get behind the wheel of a Ferrari and you're going to spin it out pretty quickly unless you know what you're doing. And that's what we have here, is we have a Ferrari of a cultivation system and it takes trained operators in order to make it work. And that's just the grow side. There's also marketing and distribution, compliance and quality control, research and product development, which is why other schools are also starting pot programs. Straight line. Here at the University of Guelph, they're laying out the footprint for a building designed specifically for weed research. This is where the new so, facility will go? Yeah, the this is area. the new facility going to be. Right. Professor Yubin Zhang says they're probably about two years away from their own cannabis program here, but licensed producers are already knocking on his door. I frequently get phone calls. Yubin, do you have any graduate students? We want them. They need them. Can Trust is expanding, doubling the size of this facility. And that's just the beginning. Currently, uh, we're shipping to around 45,000 clients in the medical system and looking forward to being able to service 10 times that in the non-medical marketplace. Making pot no longer a sideline, but a career. Because growing weed just isn't what it used to be. Aaron Saltzman, CBC News, Vineland, Ontario. The moment is up next. You'll meet the so-called Cajun Navy rescuing people caught in Tropical Storm Florence. We continue to watch Florence as it hovers over the southeastern U.S. It was a hurricane, now it's a tropical storm, and winds are expected to weaken over the weekend. But still the big concern heavy rain and flash flooding because remember it is the water often more so than the wind that can be deadly but something else you can count on finding a small army of volunteers marshalling their own resources their own boats to rescue anyone stranded or hurt they call themselves the cajun navy and their work is our moment of the day 
right now the weather is really really bad what we're doing is we, we are at a we're at a church right now we've got about 60 guys here so what we're going to do is we're going to hunker down as a group and uh, we're going to get started back in the morning hopefully. a lot of our guys rescued a lot of people this morning we had uh 57 confirmed uh, rescued this morning Today has been a little tough. We haven't been able to go out too much today um, after about 10 or 11 o'clock because the winds have been so high. But to me, it's always been bittersweet. I mean, you're saving people on one hand, but on the same token, you know, you're bringing somebody back that, that's suffered a loss. Um, they're happy to see us, you know, but deep in my heart, I know that everyone that we picked up has had a loss, whether it was, you know, possessions of the house or, you know, an animal that they lost. So uh, it's kind of bittersweet. You know, Ian, I think there are probably a lot of words you could use to describe those folks. Thoughtful, generous, industrious, uh, selfless. I would add resourceful mm -hmm. to the list because, you know, they've got their own boats, which they use, of course, but in a pinch. I mean, they've used air mattresses in the past to rescue people, whatever they can do to help. And, and they are volunteers, right? Like, as far as I can tell, everything I've looked at, Brendan, our producer, sent us some notes on this. They they just, from hundreds of miles, kilometers around, they uh, just jump on their trucks and, and head to where there is flooding. And so this spirit of volunteerism, it's not just the Cajun Navy. There are other groups as well that have come in there. And uh, I, I'm sure it's in times risking their life, certainly using a lot of their time and effort to, uh, to help rescue people. So... An impressive spirit uh, up and down the East Coast. That is the National for September the 14th. Good night. Good night.